So the agenda, uh, just before we commence in earnest, I'll go through the agenda and a few webinar housekeeping items. Tonight will be uh, somewhat like what you might expect of a BBC Question Time format. Our chair will introduce the evening and talk about decarbonisation in the Sheffield City region. Our four panellists will then speak for about 10 minutes each before being given the opportunity to question each other and discuss issues raised in their respective presentations. We will then have time for audience questions before uh, wrapping up and closing the evening for 8 p.m. We are not going to do live spoken questions this evening. So if you could please put questions in writing in the Q&A box, which, you should, uh, which should be available to you on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, please use the Q&A box and, and not any other box like the chat box as we won't be monitoring those. Uh, I and some colleagues will call it, collate and feed through your questions to our chair for distributing to the panel at the appropriate time. Uh, and do feel free to ask questions throughout, throughout the presentations and log them in the box. Um, and we'll do our best to get the most popular questions and themes through to the panellists uh, for the question period. After the uh, introduction from our chair, about 15 minutes in, there will be a poll that will pop up on the right hand side for one minute um, of your screen. So, and this is just uh, for us to see from which institutions our attendees have, have come. So we would be grateful if you would uh, complete that when the time comes. Uh, please also note that there are layout options uh, in WebEx for you to personalise your view. Uh, can I recommend that you, uh, that you tick the box, hide participants with video off, um, as that will hide those of us that are in the background doing the administration and it will tidy up your view so that you see our chair and the panellists along with the presentation. Uh, finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be published along uh, with the slides at some stage shortly by ICE. And so, uh, to the event proper. Our chair this evening is Mr Peter Kennan. Peter is a private sector board member of the Sheffield City Region Local Enterprise Partnership. He's the chair of the Sheffield Chamber of Commerce and Industry Transport Forum. Uh, and he is a board member of Transport for the North. Peter worked in Sheffield and Doncaster as a chartered accountant in private practice for almost all of his pro professional career, acting for all sizes of businesses from corner shop to quoted PLC, but with a lot of emphasis on, S on the SME sector, which makes up so much of our local economy and is so important to it. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for, for uh, offering your services to chair this evening. I will hand over presenting control to you now and let you begin. Well, thank you, uh, Peter, for that very kind introduction. Um, before I introduce the expert, panel of speakers that are here this evening. Uh, just allow me 10 minutes to set the scene and look at what Sheffield City Region is doing. My role um, is to uh, be heavily involved in the transport and inf transport infrastructure and environmental side of Sheffield City Region. And I co-chair the uh, Transport Environment Board. A good starting point uh, to look at what we're talking about this evening is to look at our strategic economic plan uh, that has recently been signed off, which has a completely different vision to the previous one and talks about growth in our economy that is both inclusive and sustainable. And by sustainable, we actually mean two things. We mean um, sustainable um, in terms of environmental uh, approach to things, but also the opportunities uh, the, the region can have to grow uh, on the back of low carbon opportunities in the economy. It is a LEP document, um, but is uh, 
sponsored also by uh, the mayoral combined authority led by Mayor Dan Jarvis and the local authority leaders. Just to give you some high level figures out of there, the key one on there is that we will have a net zero carbon city region by 2040. But you have some other statistics there of uh, what we hope to achieve. Uh, to deliver higher level jobs, more investment in R&D, better skills, productivity, and then innovation. You can't say it enough. We need to grow through innovative technologies. So just to take you through uh, how we've got to where we are, and we are still at the start of the journey, and I am not a specialist. Um, I'll take you through where we're heading uh, in a few moments. So we declared a climate emergency. The mayor's uh, climate emergency response framework uh, was developed uh, with some key themes and a net zero partnership was established with some of the anchor institutions within South Yorkshire to provide high level advice on what uh, we should be doing as a region. That culminated, that work culminated with an energy strategy, which I will just talk about in a moment. And now we're on to implementation, uh, which is led through the Transport and Environment Board, which I co-chair with one of the local authority leaders. So we've decided to focus, first of all, on carbon reduction uh, as a key driver. Why? Um, Partly because uh, there is a degree more local control over delivery of such projects. Of course, we need government finance to do them, but we feel that starting uh, with that route uh, will get us to make some progress in the shortest possible time. We have to, it's like a jigsaw though, we have to mesh in all our plans, both with the local authorities, uh, with Transport for the North on the transport side, uh, and in fact, there is a meeting of the Board of Transport for the North tomorrow to adopt a decarbonisation strategy, which has been very well received uh, by those who have seen it. And we've also had the launch recently of the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. So to the energy policy that was adopted in the middle of 2020. Uh, main areas uh, of focus, um, on, or on business and skills, infrastructure, the built environment and transport. I don't want to labour these slides too much, but it, this will just give you a flavour on each of the thematic areas of where we're, where we're heading. So we have uh, objectives and we have outcomes. At the top are the objectives. So we want clean, efficient business growth. We want to upskill the workforce, the energy workforce. And we want to promote industrial carbon uh, decarbonisation. And you'll see the outcomes we expect below. On infrastructure, uh, we want to better use the infrastructure we have for energy efficiency, for low uh, carbon generation of energy. Uh, we want to enhance our energy resilience and we want to drive investment in heat decarbonisation. On built environment, uh, we want to improve energy efficiency of existing dwellings, and we'll be uh, looking at that a little later in the session. Uh, increase the standard of new dwellings and enable some community energy schemes to develop. And on transport, uh, we are promoting and incentivizing active travel. You will have heard about the 166 million we were awarded on the Transforming Cities Fund. Um, a large part of that is going into the development of active travel infrastructure and promotion uh, led by Dame Sarah Story. We have the delivery of clean transport networks you may have seen that we have uh, just, there's just been an announcement this last week of a uh, electric trial of buses in Doncaster. And we also want to accelerate uh, the uptake of low emission vehicles using appropriate infrastructure. 
just a little bit on carbon reduction uh, within there. Some of the things that we're looking at, I, I, I shan't, uh, I shan't labour them, but we are looking at uh, housing energy efficiency, um, heat network expansion, and low carbon construction specifically as some of our key target areas and uh, zero carbon electricity generation at uh, residential ev charging as i've mentioned and um, public transport interventions as you've seen from the energy strategy so i hope that just gives you a, a flavor of of what we're doing what we're heading to um, but it is early days and i'm here to listen and to learn and to take back to Sheffield City Region everything that is relevant um, because uh, there is a lot to do. Uh, it feels like an enormous amount to do. Sometimes it feels like too much to do, but um, we have to take it piece by piece and pick away towards this target of net zero. So I hope that's helpful by way of an introduction. I now need to just uh, mention uh, the poll that uh, we're going to have, um, which will pop up on the screen, I believe, uh, shortly. Um, there is about one minute available to fill in the poll. If you could do that, please. And whilst you're doing that, um, I would like uh, to introduce Danielle, who is our first speaker. So. Uh, Dr. Dian, uh, Danielle uh, Densley Tingley, uh, Senior Lecturer in Architectural Engineering at the University of Sheffield. It, she's passionate about reducing the impact um, of the built environment on the planet, particularly focusing on how we use our materials and can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and thus minimise climate change. Throughout her research, she aims to work with industry partners in order to put research into practice and deliver a real change in the built environment. So it's great to welcome Danielle here, and I will now hand over to her. Thanks very much, Peter, um, for the introduction, and thanks for having me here today. So I'm going to talk through um, some opportunities for decarbonising the built environment, particularly focusing on buildings within the built environment. So I'm not going to talk too much about infrastructure. Uh, let me just see if I've got control of the slides. Perfect. So first off, let's just set the scene for. Think, excuse me, Diane, uh, uh, Danielle. I think Joanne is supposed to hand over the ball to you, according to my notes. It seems that I've still got control at the moment, so I will just deal with that. Or just hang fire a sec, then. Otherwise, I'll be talking about a slide no one can see. Possible, I can hand it to you. Let me just try that. I can. Danielle, that's with you now. Perfect, thank you. All right, so first off, let's just start off by setting the scene for UK decarbonisation requirements. This graph here shows you our kind of current trajectory. Um, so we can see we have decreased emissions um, and then it shows policy, current policy um, projections and where that will get us. And actually really that's looking pretty flat where policy will get us. And then if we're gonna hit net zero by 2050, we're gonna need this very steep decline to get there. Now, of course, the longer it takes us in the UK and South Yorkshire to um, take action, the less time we really have to reduce our emissions because we can think about a carbon budget for the UK. So to stay within one and a half to two degrees of warming, which is what the UK is committed to as part of the Paris Agreement, we have a limited amount of carbon we can emit globally. And if we ratio this down to the UK, we have a carbon budget for the UK. And indeed, we could ratio this down to different sectors within the UK as well, which I'll talk about as we go on. So that hopefully sets the context. We've got an awful lot to do, as Peter says, in quite a short amount of time. But where are the emissions in terms of the built environment? So overall, the built environment accounts in terms of uh, about 40% of the UK's emissions in its operation and construction. So it's whole life cycle emissions. And in terms of where those emissions are in the whole life cycle, we see an increasing amount of those emissions, that proportion being um, 
our embodied emissions. So our embodied emissions are all those associated with our material use within the built environment. So manufacturing materials, extracting them, processing them, transporting them to site, constructing our buildings, maintaining our buildings, and demolishing our buildings, or ideally deconstructing our buildings. And what we've seen as the UK grid has decarbonized, the electricity grid has decarbonized, that our embodied emissions make up a higher proportion or an increasing proportion of our total built environment emissions. So they went from 18% to 26% from 2010 to 2014. And we're only likely to see this increase. Now, of course, our operational emissions still make up a considerable proportion of those total emissions. And actually, that's where most of our legislation to date has really focused. So what are the opportunities here within our operational emissions? Let's think about this first, particularly in the context of the existing stock, because the UK has a fairly static stock. We don't build that much compared to what we already have. Now, really, our biggest opportunity, and Peter already started to highlight this for the Sheffield um, city region, our biggest opportunity in reducing our, our operational emissions is retrofit. Now, how big a challenge is retrofit? So if we look to England alone, we have 22.7 million homes. So that's an awful lot of homes. Only 1% of those meet modern uh, standards of thermal efficiency. And our modern standards are in fact insufficient. Everything we build now pretty much will need to be retrofit um, to be able to be net zero by 2050. We have a very old building stock. In fact, one of the old build oldest building stocks in Europe. And heating is one of the biggest challenges. So we're very reliant, as most of you I'm sure are aware, on gas boilers within our built environment, uh, particularly the residential built environment. So that's a huge challenge in how we decarbonise that. And of course, there's another number of other drivers and challenges around decarbonising, particularly our, how, our homes. Four million households in the UK are in fuel poverty. The impact of cold homes on health uh, is significant. And then this has a knock-on impact on the NHS. So there's lots of reasons to be doing retrofit. And of course, there's a cost to do it. And that is partly why we're not seeing the levels that we need to. So if we say there's a very big challenge for retrofit, let's put that into context of what I said before about our residential carbon budget. So we've got a budget for the whole of the UK and we could ratio that carbon budget down to our residential stock to try and understand well, how much, how many emissions do we have to play with out to 2050. Now you could ratio this in different ways depending on the uh, kind of budgeting approach you take and I've shown two here. Now which of those is, is kind of not so important but that gives us a range that we're going to try and aim for in terms of um, where we need to keep our residential emissions within. So if that's our budget, that's our budget range that we need to keep our emissions in. We then look to see what retrofit measures we need to deploy to stay within our carbon budget within England. And this graph shows you a range of different measures that we looked at deploying. And what we found was that no single measure in retrofit terms was sufficient. Heat pumps are the only thing really. Um, so we were looking at technology that could be readily deployed today. Heat pumps were the biggest single uh, way of reducing emissions. And that's largely because that was decarbonising our heat. We were removing gas. Um, so that made the single biggest difference. And generally what you often see with heat pumps is you also want to improve fabric efficiencies because that is going to make uh, homes more thermally comfortable. And indeed, the only measures that we're going to meet the stricter Tyndall budget, so where we uh, have allocate less emissions, is if we combine heat pumps with full um, insulation deployment across the stock, as well as double glazing across the stock. So there's really quite ambitious things we need to do here. And we looked at this across a couple of electricity uh, grid decarbonisation scenarios, because again, that's affecting the emissions associated with using heat pumps, which still require some electricity to be used. We also looked here, so this isn't just looking at our operational emissions, this was looking at the impacts of the materials we would use to retrofit the stock. And the blue lines on this graph are showing you the difference depending on what uh, materials we use to retrofit. So actually our material choices, given our very limited budget, are quite significant and could really help us to meet the more stringent budgets. Obviously, this just gives you a picture of what we might uh, need to get to. But what it's important to recognise is what you've just seen assumes we retrofit every single eligible house in England this year. And only then could we meet some of those really stringent targets. Now, OK, if we took the more relaxed version, we've maybe got 
a few more years, let's say five if we're feeling generous. But that means that our current government targets fall far short of being able to meet carbon budgets. And we urgently need more legislation, incentives and financial support to increase the pace and scale of retrofit if we're going to meet UK decarbonisation targets. Of course, another option would also be that the domestic sector needs to take a bigger share of those carbon emissions. But I'm sure we'll see that there's lots of different um, sectors that might fight transport being another one for their larger share of emissions. So that was looking at our operational emissions. Now let's have a quick look at how we might decarbonise our embodied emissions and some of the research going on in my group around this. So we've got a project that's looking to try and understand what Sheffield and indeed all of the UK is made of. So to do this, we're developing a multi-scale framework that tries to assess the embodied carbon of the existing stock and the circular economy potential of this stock. We want to understand what resources we have stocked, how much of them we have stocked and where we can find those resources. What this would mean is that we can then start to more strategically deconstruct our buildings to recover resources and then reuse them in the future, reducing our need for energy intensive new materials, which is going to reduce those embodied emissions um, that I showed you early on in the presentation. So this is the framework that we're wanting to develop. Now, what does this look like? Now, there's a series of steps. The first step is the kind of um, steps that you can see in the kind of yellow and brown on this slide. So this is what we would call our traditional archetype method. And this looks at using a series of case studies and assessing the material intensity within them, classifying them according to different building types. So we'll be looking at them according to use type as well as construction type and deriving a material intensity coefficient per archetype. And we'll be taking this data from both industry partners that we're working with, as well as archives and con typical construction techniques of different times. And that's our kind of traditional, uh, what we call a material stock approach. We're then combining this with um, the turquoise data that you can see there, the marvel. Um, and this is looking at remote sensing data and how we can collect more data on the ground. And I'll show you a little bit more about that um, project shortly. We're also looking at methods to develop and understand uh, what circular economy potential of our building stock is. And I'll talk a little bit more about a tool we've developed to assess that. And then ideally, we're then looking to compare our different results from the different techniques. So I mentioned Marvel. So what's Marvel? Marvel is our um, basically a souped up Google car, really, is a good description. So it's a van that we have that has a LiDAR, which basically gives you a point cloud of everything it um, sees when it drives around. So higher buildings might be out of, um, out of sight, but low rise generally will capture. Visual imaging, thermal imaging and hyperspectral cameras are also on it. And what this means is we can start to create 3D urban surface maps. So we're just in the early stages of starting to try and develop these, where we can then start to try and identify and classify different stock objects. We'll be using computer vision techniques to try and recognise different key components of the stock. So we've already got a model that's working pretty well uh, to recognise windows, doors, um, chimneys, so kind of key facade components. The next step is trying to automate uh, an understanding of how big those components are, because if we know how many doors we've already got in stock, we can start to understand what the reuse potential or indeed the replacement potential might be if we were going to retrofit all of that stock. And we're also going to try and understand, um, look at methods to automate uh, material recognition so that we can understand how many facades are made of brick so that we can understand automatically what our brick stock is in Sheffield and indeed the UK. So we're combining this as well with our tool called Regenerate, which looks at how circular your building is. And the aim of this is to encourage the design of adaptable and deconstructible buildings that make use of existing resources and materials. And we'll be using this framework to assess the existing stock and look at the potential for reuse and adaptability within that stock. It's also useful for um, designing new buildings. So if any of you are interested, you can go have a look um, at the website that's shown at the bottom of the slide. So we'll bring all of these different elements together to deliver four key outputs. 
One uh, where we're assessing individual buildings, uh, where we've got data from industry partners, we'll be sharing the individual building results to those partners, so the embodied carbon and the circular economy potential to help, help influence, uh, you know, to, to help uh, either clients or designers understand what they're currently designing um, and, it, and its impacts, and maybe that can influence future design. We'll be comparing the traditional uh, archetype approach, so the material stocks, uh, with our remote sensing approach and seeing how close those different results are. And that will give additional information on how we can actually improve the resolution of our understanding of our cities. And we'll then be looking at the circular economy and embodied carbon of Sheffield and the UK's building stock. And this will help us to start to look and map future UK material demand scenarios. So there, what I've done is given you a very quick fly through of some of the research that we've been doing within my group around decarbonising the built environment. Hopefully that gives you a picture of what we've been up to. Thank you very much for listening uh, and to the wider team involved in the work and you can see all their faces at the bottom there um, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much Daniel. Uh, uh, we will look forward to the panel discussion because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions arising um, out of that. Um, I found that fascinating. Um, could I just remind um, everyone um about the q a uh, if you look on the right hand side in my case of the screen uh, you'll see uh, a q a box where you can ask any questions and we'll be picking up as many of those as we can um, as we go through the session um i hope but joanne is now going to pass control over to our next speaker um who is martin wood um martin um is supply chain uh, specialist at the Department for International Trade. Uh, he's a Russell Group degree qualified engineer uh, with a postgraduate degree in microelectronics. Uh, 25 year career, more than 25 year career in industry, primarily in the aut automotive sector, starting at Ford in the UK, uh, and then taking positions in both the engineering and manufacturing functions. Uh, as MD of a leading automotive tier one supplier, he gained uh, wide experience in the industry and its supply chains, particularly with electrical and electronic products, including components used in electric vehicles. Uh, Martin joined UK Trade and Investment Automotive Investment Organisation as Business Development Director, which is now part of the Department for International Trade's auto team. And he's leading on investment in all areas of EV supply chain. So welcome, Martin, very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction, Peter. Um, yeah, a real pleasure to be here today. I perhaps should start by saying that the, uh, the Russell Group University was, uh, was Sheffield University. So uh, let's say I have, uh, I have some skin in the game, particularly as I, uh, I still live in the region, uh, despite having an office in London. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks again. Uh, I wanted to talk um, of our uh, investment opportunities we see in the, uh, let's say, zero emission space, um, but also just to touch on some of the policy aspects which should dovetail quite nicely, I think, with uh, some of the topics that Danielle brought up in her piece. Of course, this is a uh, this is a team game, and just as we've we've already touched on uh, the challenges around the the, the building stock, um, transport also has its own challenges for sure. Um, so the first slide, um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the move to zero emission vehicles. Uh, obviously, in the news towards the end of last year was the the pull forward. Um, to 2030, when we're going to see the restriction, uh, or in fact, the ending of sale of petrol and diesel vehicles. Now, there is a five year grace period um, up to 2035 for certain types of hybrids. In fact, that's out for consultation at the moment uh, from the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles, uh, OZEV. If people have an interest, please do, uh, please do engage. Um, and certainly the policy here that we're taking is very progressive. It's one of the most progressive within the G20. Uh, and the idea is not just to uh, be progressive on the policy from the consumer demand side, but also 
to put the UK at the forefront of design and manufacturing of zero emission vehicles, uh, which is very much a topic close to my heart. I'm just uh, kind of putting, uh, putting that piece in context with the overall 10 point plan, um, which uh, again, many, many people joining us will have seen uh, again towards the end of last year. The 10 point plan really uh, aims to put uh, the UK's green industrial revolution ambitions very much front and centre, and perhaps most importantly, uh, to fund it as well and to support business as business looks to invest and make some of these big transformation steps and to help de risk it. Um, I've just um, kind of highlighted the things that are of relevance to me, if you like, in the work that I'm doing around uh, zero emission vehicles. So, the first bullet I already touched on. Um, the second bullet I think is really important. It's the release of the Automotive Transformation Fund, which I will touch on uh, in a slide or two's time. And the third bullet is, is funding uh, to accelerate the rollout of EV charging uh, infrastructure. And for sure, uh, particularly having uh, ITM on the same panel, uh, an excellent local company, um, it's not just about electric vehicles, there's other solutions. There's, there's fuel cell electric, there's potential hydrogen. And you see within the rest of the 10 point plan, you see the uh, ambitions on the hydrogen side. And at the top of the chain, uh, you see ambitions on uh, the opportunity to advance offshore wind. And our um, capacity around offshore wind and the ability to utilize that green energy in our industry is a real point of difference for the UK. So that's something you know, really to think on and to take stock on. Um, so I, I touched on the automated transformation fund, but I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, a wider picture on the pools of funding available that I'm certainly working on in a daily basis. So going from left from, from left to right, um, 80 million for the uh, development of EV motors and power electronics. This is known as the driving the electric revolution challenge. Um, and I have a slide on that shortly. Um, moving to the next uh, number, the 274 million, which was the launch number for the Faraday uh, battery challenge. Um, that challenge fund now sits at 320 million. And again, I'll touch on that uh, slightly more through the deck. Uh, the last two uh, areas of government support, funding support, 50% uh, funding through the Advanced Propulsion Centre, which has so far deployed up to a billion of R&D monies into industry. And again, there are local companies uh, that may be on the call today that have utilised that excellent uh, funding support. And the most recent addition to the, the suite of, uh, let's call them financial tools, is the Automotive Transformation Fund, which is up to a billion pounds of funding to support businesses in their capex demands as they look to invest. The first half billion has been launched as part of the 10 point plan. So I'm going to touch into a little bit more detail in some of those areas. And I'm starting off with, uh, with quite a busy slide on driving the electric revolution. But the messages are fairly straightforward and fairly simple and companies in the Sheffield City region should look to engage uh, in this support. Um, so power electronics, uh, electric machines and drives, we're very much targeting the supply chains of those sectors. Uh, and in fact, as I stop to think, I know of at least one local company that is already engaged on, on the, the funding support here to help build those supply chains for the future. And of course, where DIT can support is we can support connections both nationally, but perhaps more important globally, looking for suppliers, partners, or indeed customers. So beyond the supply chains, we're looking to support R&D, uh, we're looking to support the networking and collaboration I've just touched on. And of course, perhaps for me, um, the real um, kind of point of difference and, and at the sharp end is the industrialization and manufacturing, which again is a, 
as a region very proud for our manufacturing heritage, um, that this is something that we could look to exploit. And again, as I've already touched on, there's a number of really, uh, really quality companies within Sheffield City region that work in this space today and manufacture within our region. Uh, talent is the last point to say. We, we talk a lot about talent in industry. Um, you know, so there's a there's a great chance there. There's uh, around six million pounds set aside straight away to support the upskilling and reskilling towards power electronics, motors, and drives. Um, I speed up a touch because I, I recognise we've a lot to get through tonight. So the Faraday uh, battery challenge is uh, 320 million or 318 to be precise of government money put uh, put aside to support our move towards batteries. Um, the Battery Industrialisation Centre I'll come on to. Um, I guess the, the key things to, to talk about uh, at, at this point really are the collaborative R&D and the fundamental research programmes that are available through the, uh, through the Faraday Battery Challenge and the Faraday Institution. And I'm pleased to say, having uh, obviously done a, at least a small bit of homework for today, uh, I'm really pleased to see that uh, at least Sheffield University is fully engaged with the Faraday Battery Challenge. Um, okay, moving to uh, the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre. Now, this is uh, now this is based in Coventry, which um, in, in normal times is not so far away. I would urge local companies though, that have an interest um, to engage with the facility. It's a national facility. It isn't just for the Midlands. And there are companies in our region who can benefit uh, using the equipment, the, uh, the world-class equipment, which is going through final commissioning. In fact, some, some parts of the processes are already set up. Um, it's a great way to support scale-up and to de-risk as you move from the lab uh, into, into production. Um, if anyone has any uh, kind of questions on this, I'm, I'm really happy to make connections for people to UK BIC. Okay, moving on to, okay, how do we industrialize this? What sort of demand do we see? And again, this is a UK picture, but for me, there is, uh, there's a lot of technology uh, a lot of uh, experience and intellect within our region, thinking particularly of, of David Stone's group uh, within Sheffield University, for example, um, that we can look to exploit uh, the UK picture and the UK demand picture. Uh, we see around 70 gigawatt hours of battery demand by uh, 2030. Um, you'll hear gigafactories is the kind of industry standard term. Uh, wherever there's a gigafactory, they need suppliers, they need R&D support, um, and it drives investment and drives jobs. Um, so where would that investment sit? And this is a really busy slide, and, and really it's not to, uh, let's say, strain your eyes to have a look at all the details, but it's really to demonstrate that there's a really clear understanding of what the value chain of battery uh, lithium iron or, or LFP even battery value chains look like. Um, and we're hunting investment opportunities to support companies that want to invest along this value chain. I'm pleased to say I know of, I'm, well, I'm intimately involved with at least one company in the region who has interest to invest in this space. And then moving back to uh, power electronics, motors and drives. Uh, in this case, the e-machine or the electric motor. Uh, again, we are hunting opportunities to make sure these competencies are industrialised in the UK and for tonight's audience, let's say hopefully as many as possible within the Sheffield City region. Um, those of you that with more eagle eyes will see at least two names on this slide uh, are actually from within our region. So that's um, that's all I had to talk about today, Peter. Hopefully, I've not taken up too much time. And and please, thank you to the audience for your uh, for your time. And look forward to the uh, to the debate and uh, panel discussion with with Danielle and others uh, coming shortly. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. I found that extremely uh, 
useful uh, background and uh, I'm sure everyone attending did too and I, I also look forward to the questions later. Um, just a reminder to everyone again that we have the Q&A boxes there and I'm waiting for your questions so uh, feel free to put your question in. Uh, I'm now going to uh, hand over to our next speaker. I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Dr. Graham Cooley, uh, Chief Executive of ITM Power here with us today. Joined ITM Power uh, in 2009 as CEO and ITM Power is the first hydrogen related company to be listed on the London stock market and has been developing electronicizer equipment for over 20 years. Uh, Graham started uh, in the power sector in 1989 uh, by joining the CEGB and has progressed through uh, National Power, uh, International Power PLC, uh, developing energy storage and new generation technologies. He was CEO of uh, Sensatech uh, Limited and uh, founding CEO of uh, Metalysis, uh, a spin out from Cambridge University, and founding CEO of Metanova uh, Limited. He's got a PhD in physics, an MBA, fellow of the Institute of Metals, Minerals and Mining, and sits on a number of industry bodies and is a member of the UK government's Hydrogen Advisory Council. So delighted to have you here, Graham. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, so uh, let me just see if I can click the slides over. Yep, there we are. Great, okay. Uh, so thanks for having me today and uh, just going to run through a few slides to give you an introduction to ITM Power and, and what is it that we do. So um, <clears throat> we make a device called an electrolyzer. Actually an electrolyzer takes in water and electricity and splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And actually the hydrogen is a replacement in industry for either natural gas or petrol and diesel in transport, or indeed the early entry market, which is for uh, replacing grey hydrogen in industry. And industry uses a huge amount of hydrogen today. So I think one of the misconceptions about hydrogen is that it's somehow a new market that needs to be created. Actually, in Europe, we use 400 terawatt hours a year of grey hydrogen. That goes into refineries, production of methanol, production of ammonia. And if you look at refineries, if you were to replace 10% of the hydrogen at used at refineries today to decarbonise those refineries, that would be 90 billion euros of market. And in fact, under the Renewable Energy Directive, um, refineries have to make 14% of their product renewably over the next decade. So that's a 90 billion market over the next decade for just one subsector of the applications for hydrogen. The, the reason that hydrogen and green hydrogen is now considered so important is that green hydrogen it is the best way of storing excess renewable power for long periods of time. And green hydrogen is the only net zero energy gas. So hydrogen is literally the only fuel that's got no carbon molecule. So that's why everybody is so incredibly interested now in green hydrogen. And uh, I was interested in Mar what Martin said about gigafactories and, and the desire to have a gigafactory uh, for batteries in the UK. Actually, the UK does have one gigafactory and you may not know it, but it's in Sheffield and it's our new factory, Bessemer Park, just off the junction 34 of the M1 opposite Meadow Hall. We moved in the first Monday of this year and it has a manufacturing capacity of 1000 megawatts of electrolyzers per annum or one gigawatt. And it's the world's largest electrolyzer factory. Um, we currently have a backlog of 124 million pounds worth of projects. 
Over the last 12 months, we bid 435 million pounds of capital. Uh, in October, we raised 172 million. We were actually two and a half times oversubscribed. We could have taken 0.4 billion. Um, and I have to tell you that the city is absolutely committed now to funding uh, green technologies, and most particularly green hydrogen and electrolyzer companies. And we got a strategic investment from SNAM. SNAM are the world's second largest gas transmission company, second only to, to Gazprom. Um, we sold um, a couple of weeks off after moving into the factory the world's largest PEM electrolyzer to Linda. It's an export from Sheffield to the chemicals industry in Germany. We're designing, uh, doing what's called a front end engineering design study uh, with Orsted and Philips 66 to connect 100 megawatts of electrolysis directly to Hornsey 2 and supply the green hydrogen to the Philips 66 refinery. And last week, we announced the sale to Shell of the new world's largest chem electrolyzer of 100 megawatts. And that's going into the Vesemin refinery. We've already built with Shell a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, and ITM Power has built all of the hydrogen refueling stations in the UK, apart from the one built by BOC, who's a strategic partner. We built them on shelf four courts. And in fact, our first hydrogen refueling station and the first uh, ever hydrogen refueling station where the electrolyzer is connected directly to a wind farm is in Sheffield. It's at the advanced manufacturing farm. So not only does Sheffield have the world's largest electrolyzer manufacturing factory, it has the only uh, hydrogen refueling station in the UK that has achieved the RTFO or the Renewable Transport Fuels Obligation Certificate. Um, we have a strategic partnership with Scottish Power and part of the Liverpool Group to build electrolysis plants um, in Scotland. And, and we have very strong momentum with Linda. Linda is the world's largest employer of grey hydrogen to industry. And they're a strategic investor of ITM. Um, what's so important about hydrogen? So the, the cost of hydrogen has come down dramatically as the cost of renewable power has come down. At the same time as the cost of renewables has come down, the volume has gone up and more and more renewable power is being deployed all over the world. And actually, as you have more and more renewables, you need more and more energy storage. So question is, what's the best way of storing electrons? So um, I think um, uh, in the introduction, um, it was mentioned that I was um, business development manager at National Power and then International Power. Actually, my interest was in energy storage. And I can tell you the best way of storing electrons is to turn them into molecules. And actually, it's a process called power to X. And you start with, an electrolyzer, you make green hydrogen, and then you have a whole series of other target molecules that you can make. And at the same time as the need is going up and the costs are going down, of course, we have net zero targets. And green hydrogen is the only net zero energy market. So here's a statistic for you. In the EU's green recovery package, which is 1 trillion euros, 15% of it is for green hydrogen. So that's 150 billion euros over the next decade. That, that's 100 billion, 10 billion a year for 10 years for contracts for different sorts of for green hydrogen. And, and you can see in brackets all those countries and what their targets are for electrolyzers. Five gigawatts, four gigawatts, two gigawatts. In the UK, we have a target of five gigawatts. ITM Power is the world's largest manufacturing plant for electrolysis. We're the only company with a gigafactory giga in the space. 
look at the export potential from Sheffield. Uh, we, we have strong global partners, Shell, Linda, SNAM, Orsted, Iberdrola, and it is a genuinely massive market. So our journey then, we, we've been developing uh, electrolysis for 20 years. I started my career in the CGB. I worked on fuel cells, batteries, supercapacitors, all forms of advanced power generation technologies. I ran a thing called the Future Plant Group. We built the world's largest um, energy store, electrochemical energy store at Little Buffett, 100 megawatt hours, which was only recently beaten by Elon's battery in Australia. Uh, we're not new to this. We've been doing this for 20 years in Sheffield. Um, and uh, we launched our first products at Hanover in 2011. Fast forward um, nine years, and we scaled up by three orders of magnitude. That's scaled up by a thousand times. Gone from 10 kilowatt units, the size of a fridge, to full installations in the middle of a shell refinery. It's a serious amount of scale up. And we are now looking at deploying 100 megawatt plants in the fuel industry. Um, th these are our uh, modules. They are um, electrolyzer modules. This is a bit that takes in the water and the electricity, splits the water, makes the hydrogen. If you use renewable power, then you're storing the renewable power as molecules and you turn a net zero electron into a net zero molecule. The world only uses energy in two forms, electrons and molecules, and you have to have both. And the device which converts between the two is the electrolyzer. Um, so we're moving from two megawatt modules to five megawatt modules. We're pre-engineering 20 megawatt packages with Linda. Linda has huge purchasing power in the industry for cost reduction. This is what a full electrolyzer system looks like. This is 100 megawatts, the result of a front-end engineering design study with Linda, with Orsted, and with Philip 66. And this is a project called Gigastack, funded by Bayes. And, and this is um, uh, the, the uh, plant that will be uh, connected to Hornsey, which is the world's largest offshore wind farm, about 1.4 gigawatts, it's Hornsey 2. And, and the hydrogen goes straight into the Philip 66 refinery. No need for infrastructure. You put the electrolyzer down right next to the Hornsey substation and a pipe goes straight into the refinery and you're decarbonizing immediately. Uh, it's a full system and it's the type of system that we just announced a sale uh, to Shell in Germany. Uh, this is our factory, Bessemer Park, Shepcote Lane. This is the old British steel stainless steel site. You, you probably all know it. Um, it's uh, just off of Junction 34, uh, 134,000 square feet. We raised enough money to build inventory so we could reduce our lead times down to eight months. We've also raised enough money to build a second gigafactory should we need to expand. And can we reallocate it in the 172 million funding now, 24 million. We've taught the whole generation of hydrogen engineers in the UK. We have apprenticeship schemes. We have in a recruitment drive at the moment. Currently, we are recruiting 80 new engineers. Um, and everybody in the hydrogen industry in some way has been through one of our R&D facilities or factories in the UK. Um, Martin mentioned the 10 point plan. Point number one of the 10 point plan, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind. Now, if you look at the UK peak for electricity, the UK peak, uh, when I was at school, it used to be uh, 65 to 62 gigawatts. It's come down because of energy efficiency to around 50. And because of COVID, we might even be somewhere near 45 gigawatts. And that's peak electricity demand. 
actually the gas grid is about uh, five and a half times the peak demand of the electricity network in the water. If we do 40 gigawatts of offshore wind, we're above our peak if you include uh, generation today. The UK is going to need a lot of energy storage. And actually, the best way of doing that is to turn the electrons into molecules, and the whole industry's got it. Um, Point number two is five gigawatts of hydrogen. Okay, the second bullet point, green hydrogen. And, and, and if that is from a British supplier, there's only one, and we manufacture in Sheffield. No carbon buses. You've just seen the announcement from the Advanced Propulsion Center about them funding uh, fuel cell drivetrains for buses made in Northern Ireland. Sustainable shipping and aviation fuel. How do you make sustainable aviation fuel? You capture CO2 from the atmosphere and you react it with green hydrogen made by electrolysis. Uh, sustainable shipping fuel, what is that? That's actually renewable ammonia, where you capture from the air nitrogen and you react it with green hydrogen. And then a blue hydrogen bullet point number eight. There's a lot of hydrogen. In Boris's 10 point plan. So I'd, I'd summarize by saying we're in a rapidly growing market, tens uh, uh, of gigawatts in scale. We, we have a, a very strong global leadership in technology and manufacturing. We work with some of the world's largest energy companies. They've tra transformed our backlog and our pipeline. The city are absolutely behind ITM Power. A, a, a two and a half times oversubscribed funding round uh, with enough money to build a second gigafactory when the first one is built. And it's a real, a genuine global opportunity. So thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much, Graham. I'm sure that will uh, provoke a lot of questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, what an exciting time to be sat where you're sitting as CEO of ITM Power. Um, so thank you. So in, in mentioning Q and A again, this is getting towards your last chance, last chance saloon to get questions into Q and A. So um, take the opportunity of doing that, and uh, we will be getting to them um, shortly. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor. Peter Styring from Sheffield University or the University of Sheffield. Um, from the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, he is an expert in carbon dioxide capture and utilization. He's also part of the newly launched interdisciplinary center for circular chemical economy, which will lead a new government push to revolutionize the way resources are managed in the UK's 32 billion chemical industry to build a greener, more efficient economy. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for coming along. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. OK, thank you, everyone. And thanks for the uh, for the previous speakers for, for setting this up quite nicely. Um, we're in a challenging time, certainly. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit about carbon capture and storage, but mainly about utilisation. Uh, I just want to put this Quote from a, the vice president of a blue chip multinational. If your business plan relies on carbon offsetting to reduce your emissions, please go away and write a proper business plan. Uh, and what brought this to mind was a, a regional authority in the north of England came up with a 50% decarbonisation by 2025. And when I asked what the, the, uh, the policy was for doing that, there wasn't any policy, but they had to do it, otherwise they'd seem bad. So we need to deconvolute the policy from the politics and really look at technologies that can make a difference. And I'll draw your attention to this document. So I'm on uh, two APPGs, all party uh, parliamentary groups, one on energy policy. We published this a couple of weeks ago. And the first thing we've said is please define what net zero means because there is so much confusion about net zero. 
Uh, the other group I'm on is on fairer business banking, and we published something uh, this week through Bankers for Net Zero, which is on retrofitting. So it fits in nicely with what Danielle has been talking about, re retrofitting the building stock. I think the approach we have to take is there's no silver bullet. We have to look at multifaceted approaches to decarbonisation. And I use decarbonisation because it's the standard. We've actually said that decarbonisation should be dropped because we need carbon. Life depends on carbon. Most of what we, uh, we wear, we, we sit on, we drive has carbon embedded in it. So we're talking about defossilization. So getting rid of fossil carbon from the supply chain and going to a more circular economy. So <clears throat> if we look at the Lansing hierarchy, so this was developed in, I think it was uh, 1979 by Adeline Lansing in the Dutch parliament who proposed this hierarchy where waste comes into a system and the preferred option is to avoid it or reduce it. So stop those emissions from occurring in the first place. The least preferred me method is landfill. So burying it under the ground or under the sea. And that's where carbon capture and storage comes in. Now carbon capture and utilization comes into the reuse, recycle energy production uh, area. So that's what I'm going to focus on, but I'm gonna just go through some of the drawbacks of CCS and why we shouldn't rely on it. So if we look at a circular economy, uh, I've got, uh, first of all, manufacturing. So we, we, we manufacture goods, we then sell them, uh, people use them, we then repair them if we, they can be repaired. If they can't be repaired, we either dispose of them or we re recycle them. In the case of carbon dioxide, we dispose of it or we can dispose of it using CCS carbon capture and storage, but that becomes a linear process where we just create, keep creating more fossil carbon in the supply chain. We can recycle it and that's where carbon capture and utilization comes in, uh, but we have to do a redesign. We have to think about how we make new products or we produce existing products in a new way. And the inputs for that are carbon dioxide, water and metals. So a catalyst carbon dioxide and as Graham talked about using PEM electrolysis, you can take water and using renewable or low carbon energy, we can convert that into hydrogen. And again, I would emphasize um, energy storage is key. Uh, today, I think the, uh, the renewable generation in the UK was about 32%. Uh, a couple of days ago, it was 5%. So we have that, the bumpy road of uh, energy generation but a pretty flat usage. So we need to store it as molecules. Uh, and Graham quite rightly talks of hydrogen as being key, uh, but he also mentioned power to X. And I've just spent the whole of today on a conference in Germany where that's happening. So Shell are putting um, zero scene as they call it. So low zero carbon kerosene into aircraft and flying them uh, from Amsterdam uh, to the States. So the technology for power to X is available. Britain is lagging behind in this and we really do need to play catch up uh, to get to grips with what's happening in Europe in particular. The key on the re renewable uh, fuels op obligation is that it has to come from renewable energy. We can't use fossil energy to create the low carbon fuels. So it's, it's part of the circular economy that we need to develop. CCS has been proposed as a way out of here. And I saw in the 10 point plan CCS, lots of investment. If you look at the global CCS deployment, it is so low, it's baseline compared to global emissions. So you can see from 2010 to 2020, it's barely risen. It's gone from around 16 uh, megatons per annum up to about 40 megatons per annum whereas the global emissions are 40 gigatons per annum. So you can see this is really baseline technology. And if we want to get there by 2050, there has to be a step change. Unlike electronics, there won't be an exponential growth in this. It's going to be a linear growth unless there is a really big step change in the technologies for doing carbon capture. And that will probably come from direct air capture, capturing from the atmosphere, which will make uh, synthetic fuels more neutral. 
Okay, so let's look at what deployment there is for CCS. And you can see it's very little throughout the world. And in fact, the worrying thing is these purple dots here show where facilities have been opened and then closed. If you look at these dots, the, the dark blue, these are ones that are in advanced planning. Uh, sorry, in, in, uh, in construction. A lot of these in the blue area, so the advanced development, so the, uh, the feed studies, front-end engineering design, never come to fruition. So we have a problem that we have capacity to make carbon capture and storage work, but not the technology to do that. Uh, and that's really emphasized by this slide, which shows capacity. And you can see the, U the US has huge capacity. The United Kingdom has reasonable capacity, but actual deployment is close to zero. And you look across the world and that is close to zero in every nation. So we need to either accelerate that or do something else. And the problem with CCS is it costs, it's a waste technology you have to pay to dispose. This is the proposed uh, CCS uh, hum Yorkshire and Humber pipeline. Uh, I say proposed, it's been proposed since around 2008 and it's not got any closer. And you'll see it stops in Doncaster at the Don Valley. This facility was actually closed. It, it, it never came into operation. Uh, and in fact, Ferry Bridge was still on there before it closed down. And I was involved in the CC Pilot 100 plant. That was dismantled three years after construction. So if we're going to have CCS, this pipeline has got to be built at a huge cost and it will never reach um, Sheffield. So in Sheffield, we would, the Sheffield region, we'd need to do something completely different. So that's where I come on to carbon capture and utilization. So this was uh, taken from the Global CCS uh, Institute uh, in, uh, in, now in Michigan in the States. And it looks at the emissions reduction potential for carbon dioxide utilization and also the revenue potential. And you can see that there are three areas that really stand out. One is aggregates. Another one is concrete. So that uh, sort of builds into the built environment, but construction materials are high carbon content and therefore high emissions. But this one really stands out as well, fuels. And having been on this conference today, uh, the German government is hugely financing the transition. If we look at these uh, light blue dots on fuels, then there's the potential for growth, but it's not great. If you look at the darker circle, that's what happens if you have fiscal and financial interventions. So you promote these fuels as a potential solution to the transport market. If you look at the revenue potential, it then becomes very clear why you would want to do this and not do CCS. So if you were to look at the concrete market, it's between uh, 15 and $401 billion per annum. That's revenue. If you look at fuels, it's uh, 10 to $250 billion. If you look at the whole of the utilization space, the potential global revenue is $1.1 trillion. Now, if you look at the uh, UK's projection for net zero by 2050, the Committee on Climate Change suggested that was going to cost one uh, £1 trillion pounds to implement. Bayes, on the other hand, said it was going to be more like £2 trillion. Pounds. With uh, a, a review by another group, they suggested that as projects tend not to be delivered on, on price, it's more like three to four trillion pounds. Now, if you can regenerate some of that income, that cost by income, then uh, you have a much better business proposition. People say that you can't make um, products from CO2, that they're not carbon negative, they're not carbon neutral. Well, this is Air CO, Air Company in New York City. They make something called air vodka. So they take the New York City air, they capture the CO2 from the air, and they react it with hydrogen. So again, hydrogen becomes key, and they make vodka. Very, very pure vodka. 
And during the pandemic, at the early stages when New York City was really uh, falling victim uh, to COVID, they diverted their production from vodka to hand sanitizer. And this is a low cost method of doing it. They gave these away free to New York City hospitals. Uh, this is 80% uh, ethanol produced directly from CO2 and hydrogen. So it can be done and it can be done at a reasonable cost. Now the question of electric vehicles, um, as I said, there's no silver bullet. And this is a study uh, that is done by uh, a group at the National Technical University of Norway, which looked at the comparison between diesel vehicles and electric vehicles. Now this is 2016, so I'll put a caveat in there that technology has progressed from there and the, U, uh, the EU energy mix has changed. But this gray area is the emissions associated with a diesel vehicle. So at the bottom, you've got a mini vehicle. Uh, I don't mean a mini because minis are no longer classed as minis. Uh, I'm thinking of the Toyota IO or something similar uh, through to a luxury vehicle such as a Jaguar, Land Rover uh, or, or uh, BMW, something like that. And you can see that you have this on envelope that you have the production cost of the vehicle, it, production costs in CO2 equivalents, you then have the use, so this is the use of the diesel up to 180 kilometers, and then you have the disposal costs. And onto that, they mapped on what the emissions for an electric vehicle would be using a European energy mix. So the term zero emission vehicle is not correct. It, it's a low emission vehicle, but the emissions are deferred to a power station unless there is a dedicated uh, renewable electricity generator. So if your car is plugged in to uh, a PV or a, a wind turbine, then it is zero emissions at the point of use. But there are embedded emissions because you're not using uh, pure 100% renewables. So you have this, uh, this usage, and then because you have the battery to dispose of, you have increased disposal costs. And what they showed is that for a mini vehicle, you do over the lifetime of the vehicle have lower emissions than an equivalent diesel. But for something like a Ford Focus, um, then you are right on the limit of the lower end of the, uh, the diesel use. If you were to get a Tesla, for example, which would be a category F luxury car, you would be much better if you were looking for emissions to buy um, a, a, an A-class diesel, A-class diesel such as a uh, Toyota Prius, uh, Toyota IO. Obviously, you may not want that, but in terms of emissions, that's the best way forward. Now, the dotted line is a power to X fuel. So this is dimethyl ether, uh, which is a diesel replacement. And the benefit of it is it burns much more efficiently than diesel. It doesn't give off any particular emissions or not, not any appreciable. It gives off no NOx emissions because of the increased combustion efficiency, and it gives off no SOx emissions. Overall, if you're using the Euro power uh, electricity mix, it be, it, the emissions associated with it are much lower than an electric vehicle under current technology. Now, I know things are changing, batteries are getting better. Um, but what I would say is uh, there's a, a white paper we're just about to publish uh, on the use of DME in diesel vehicles uh, in, uh, with, a, with a renewable energy source, and they become negative emissions vehicles. So you have to be very careful what, uh, what you're, um, you're actually saying. So I think this is where I just sum up. So there's no silver bullet in achieving net zero. Uh, CCS is a challenge. CCU is less challenging because you're looking at a circular approach and you have revenue, revenue uh, streams. There does need to be fiscal as well as financial interventions. Uh, and that comes out in the uh, Bankers for Net Zero report in particular. South Yorkshire will be challenging to defossilize on many levels, um, especially if we're gonna rely on CCS, which I don't think will happen within the timescales. So we need an integrated science-led policies 
and not just the political sound bites. Net zero by 2050 is probably just achievable. Anything below 2050 is really not achievable. It's an aspiration, but not, it shouldn't be considered to be a, an absolute target. Okay, that, that's me finished. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and for another very useful presentation from my point of view. And again, I'm sure the audience found it so too. Um, we'll now uh, move on to the next part of the, the evening. Um, we have a panel discussion. Now, I'm conscious of the clock. Um, we It's tw nearly 20 past seven. We, we are going to finish at eight o'clock at the very latest. And so what, I, what I'd like to do is just ask the panel a couple of questions, but could I ask uh, that the answers be relatively brief so that we can get onto some specific questions for each individual panelist as well? So maybe just a, a minute or two um, in answer to, to the question I'm going to ask each panelist could, could just um, interject and uh, make their observations. So the first question I, I have is about sustainability. It's, it was mentioned during uh, the presentations. How affordable and hence sustainable is the green revolution? Um, the cost uh, per kilowatt hour of electricity is about time, seven times the cost of gas. Is the cost of electricity going to be substantially reduced to make it affordable, bearing in mind the high cost of electricity that's already been agreed for future nuclear power? Uh, and replacing gas with electricity will need a substantial enhancement in the grid uh, involving major capital investment. So maybe a word about the grid would be useful during an answer. Uh, people are uh, people are in the audience are worried about the cost of living rocketing as a result of all this. So who would like to take that first? I'll have a go first. Thank you. Thank you. So the cost of making the energy transition is nowhere near as expensive as not making it. So what what we have to realise is the huge amount of disruption that will be caused and chaos if we don't get to less than two degrees warming. Absolutely one pales into insignificance compared with the other. I don't know if you caught Mark Carney's Reef Lecture about the view of the city, but the city are writing down fossil fuel assets like crazy. They're investing in green technologies and they're promoting green technologies because they can't underwrite their assets anymore because of what might happen. So it is expensive, but the alternative would be far worse. So that's the first point. Second point, we always think about the costs. And, and what we never think about is that this isn't only a green revolution where we've got to reduce emissions, but also we need new technology. Someone's got to manufacture them and someone's got to sell them worldwide. So although it's expensive for the country, we ought to be manufacturing the equipment that everybody else is using and buying to do the decarbonisation. That creates export revenues and it creates jobs. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Peter mentioned the figure of three trillion. Uh, if we don't make the transition and this thing really hits us, uh, that will be a tiny amount of money to what will happen. Thank you. Peter, you, you wanted to add something, I think? Yeah, two points, really. Uh, just to agree with, with Graham, it, it, it's, it's going to be the cost of making this transition is going to be less than the health implicate the cost of the health implications if we don't. The infrastructure and the health, because there will be so, you know, COVID will pale into insignificance with the ca catastrophe. Uh, there's a World Bank report from a few years ago that said the only way out is through mass extinction, which, which is a really heartless way of looking at it. Uh, if we don't act, uh, we will get uh, a really bad uh, effect on, on public health. Uh, the, the second one is, I, I'd refer you back to the Bankers for Net Zero retrofitting document, 
the banks are there, the financial institutions are looking to finance this because their future relies on a healthy nation as well. Um, and if you look at, if we can develop the technologies, the chance for international trade will grow as well. Germany are leading, like I said, we need to re reclaim that ground. So it's economics, it's health, it's the climate, everything rolls into one. We can't, uh, we, we have to have social justice in any transition that we, we produce. Sorry, Martin, would you like to? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> again, we're in uh, violent agreement. Um, I'm from Graham's, uh, I'm on Graham's team, yeah. This is a great opportunity. We've got some great technology. We've got companies like ITM that will seize that opportunity. So I choose to see the opportunity. Um, but I also agree with both gentlemen uh, and including Peter's last comments. You know, we can't afford to to not progress and to do nothing just because it's difficult or even expensive. Um, just picking up on one of Peter's last comments, the UK really has some competitive point of difference around energy provision and we should be looking to exploit that. Thinking of our huge capacity of offshore wind, uh, great stat, which I know Peter will know, I know Graham will know, and probably Danielle, but many of the people online will not know, we have the greatest or the highest capacity, installed capacity of offshore wind generation. So if we can marry that green energy up to some industrial processes to avoid the situation that Peter's mentioned around, which could potentially just be pushing emissions from the tailpipe in our cities to factories then, then we've got some reasons to be cheerful and some reasons for optimism thank you danielle yeah so just to add to that so i completely agree that you know not acting will have a huge impact but i also think it's important that you know peter said there's no one silver bullet and that's very much the case when we think about this in terms of it's not just shifting gas onto the electricity grid that that's not going to work we also need to look at how we reduce our demand for energy so retrofitting and improving fabric efficiency should be also reducing our demand as individual households i think there's a series of questions we can ask ourselves on what energy are we using how you know how big do our homes need to be do they need to be 22 degrees could it be 18 and all those sorts of things will also reduce energy demands and have a huge amount of money. thank you very much daniel i'm just getting a little bit of feedback on my mic i wonder if people um could just mute you know, whilst not speaking that would be great um the second question for all of you um, is about COVID and climate emergency, which is an interesting area. Um, and the question is, most scientists uh, believe the climate emergency is a far bigger existential threat to humanity and global security than COVID. But the levels of investment going into um, the area of the climate change agenda are small in comparison with the uh, hit to the economy that we've suffered as a result of COVID. So with the need to halve carbon emissions by 2030, and in fact, uh, some councils are trying to get to net zero by, uh, by 2030, how uh, do we accelerate decarbonisation practically whilst capturing uh, embodied carbon associated with all the initiatives proposed? would like to take that one. Uh, Peter? I'll start. So 2030 is impossible. Absolutely impossible. So new set, sale of new diesel vehicles and petrol vehicles doesn't start until 2030. A diesel vehicle has typically a 20 year lifetime. So if, unless you're going to create a social underclass of people who can't afford uh, to own their own vehicle, diesels will be around for a long time. Uh, so we need to be very careful. COVID I think the, the, the bill for COVID from the government's perspective was about 350 billion pounds. As I said, the minimum estimate for uh, climate change, uh, addressing climate change is 1 trillion. So the investment will be there. 
uh, I think that um, the transition, it's a transition. That's the key point, a transition. It's not a sudden hit the brakes uh, and, and, and restart. Uh, and one of the things about COVID was that while the emissions of CO2 went down, the emissions of particulates went up. And that's because much of the climate change, much of the air quality is centered around particles rather than chemicals. So we get back to chemicals again. Uh, be, because no nitrogen oxides were being produced, the ozone that was produced in sunlight was reacting with particles to make particles which were then respired. And respired particles can get through the systemic, uh, uh, you know, the body's systemic system. It can get to all parts, kidneys, bladder. Uh, so again, we need to look at any consequential uh, impacts of uh, what we do. Martin. Yeah, just a couple of points to make. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in the auto sector, we've seen COVID uh, accelerate transition. Um, maybe it's given people a, a greater sense that we need to get on and do the right thing. Um, Recognising that there's also uh, an economic argument there where perhaps companies were hedging their bets on a number of different potential solutions in the past, but with damaged balance sheets, they're having to place a, let's say, a clearer bet. So that's perhaps one thing. Um, the second, uh, the second point I wanted to make uh, was really around the efficiency of materials and picking up some of Danielle's comments earlier and the cost of doing so, because I think Peter makes a really, really important point. It can't just be people that can afford it that shift to zero emission vehicles. It has to be everybody. So, you know, the industry with academia with research with government financial support needs to come up with new materials new processes in order to make you know in my case here vehicles both more affordable more efficient um, in order to deliver the benefits so a classic example would be reduction of cobalt in a lithium iron cell maybe moving to lfp um, you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and you've got solid state coming down the line so you know there's a few let's say bits of uh, Bits to think about. Danielle. I think there's also an opportunity. So our embodied emissions don't have to be bad. Um, if we move to more bio-based materials for certain products and systems, then actually we might be sequestering carbon, potentially yes, for a, a period of time of, of use, but that can also start to get us to a better position by 2030 and indeed 2050. So I think, and we have legislation that does make that difficult in construction at the moment. Um, so thinking about how we use more timber-based products and how the embodied carbon can actually help us at scale. Uh, when we're retrofitting, if we're using insulation products, can we use products that are more bio-based than synthetically made, unless we're going down the kind of carbon capture and utilization route that Peter was talking about. So thinking about how we make it work for us as well, I think is really important. Thank you. Um, that's fine. Uh, would you like to say a few words, Graham? Yeah, I, I would. So I, I think the original question was comparing uh, COVID and the reaction of the governments around the world to COVID and, and the uh, climate challenge. So um, Peter's uh, 0.3 trillion, 350 billion, probably about right for COVID. I think. Um, uh, we made an incredible technology push and ended up finding a number of different manufacturers for vaccines, which is pretty good. I think we tr tried to coordinate across nations and found that incredibly difficult. In fact, we seem to be entering some kind of COVID um, vaccine war where we're actually competing with each other. So coordination hasn't been brilliant, but in some cases speed has been fast. Now you compare all those things with the environment. So first of all, our speed has been grindingly slow. We've known about the uh, environmental challenges since the 1970s and done very, very little about it. The consequences are hugely more damaging than uh, uh, what you get from a pandemic. 
you'll get some herd immunity, you'll find some vaccines. But you're not going to save the planet if it goes into a spiral of increasing temperature, permafrost melting, methane uh, being emitted. It's the ultimate challenge in technology and coordination for those other two pieces. Can't do it without everybody on the, in, on the planet being on message. You know, you, we can do it in the UK and we can make some great strides, but we need, we need China, we need South America, we need everybody to be involved in this. And the technology challenge is more than finding a vaccine. We have new vaccines and, and new variations for flu every year. So we've got some very good precedents for that sort of technology. We have to decarbonize transport and heat and industry and the whole of agriculture worldwide. Like that's a proper challenge. So it was a great analogy between COVID and um, uh, the environment. We need to be a more a, a coordination. We need to act faster and we need to develop the technologies because if we don't, we've got a problem. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham. So uh, what I'd like to do now is allocate five minutes to each uh, of our panelists to just answer a question or maybe two questions uh, posed by the audience um, that may be specifically in, of interest to, the, to their presentation. So uh, what I'm going to do, first of all, is turn to Danielle uh, as the first speaker. and. We've had a number of questions about reusability of materials um, in existing buildings. Uh, do we expect the building trade to reuse uh, bricks and slates? Uh, what about the thermal performance? And what about improving the insulation of our houses and what further can be done to make substantial improvements in thermal efficiency? So if we could just cover that uh, in, in two or three minutes, and then we'll just get a chance for the other panelists just to say a few words if they want to add a supplementary. Yeah, sure. Um, so kind of taking that in the hole around improving insulation, there's lots of homes that don't have insulation and there's lots of homes that have very little insulation. So the first thing is actually um, kind of meeting current standards or indeed surpassing them would be good. Um, so there's a large rollout of insulation that needs to happen across solid wall and cavity wall properties. Um, the thermal efficiency is all part of that and looking at the um, air tightness of the stock is also important because actually if we've got high ventilation rates of the stock, that just means we're transferring our heat through the air rather than through our walls. So we need to think about that as well. Um, and I think there was another question in there, but I've forgotten what it was. Sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, it was reuse. It was certainly it was reuse of building materials um, was, was certainly one of them. And, okay. Uh, uh, and why, why are we throwing things away that could be reused? Because surely it costs a lot of uh, energy to create them afresh. Uh, and how do you square that off? And it's almost the same question as I've been posing recently, which is, do we need to use less power or different power? Or is it, are they both equally important? Um, yeah, so with reusing materials, yeah, I mean, we need to do it. So it, it's a question of, yes, financially, I think, a reused slate, I think was the example in, in the chat, um, might not be financially worth reusing. Um, and slate isn't the highest impact material, but as soon as we start to shift to more energy intensive materials, yes, it will be financially worth reusing them. Um, and there's plenty of examples of where we reuse things like Victorian bricks, and they actually have a higher value than a new brick um, because of the heritage and the architectural, uh, architectural aesthetic that comes with them. And given, the challenge of embodied carbon and the amount of um, emissions associated with our construction materials. No, there's no silver bullet, but reuse has to be one of those options that comes into play along, um, alongside lots of other strategies because we can't quickly decarbonize how we make steel and concrete, for example. So we need to look at, you know, can we reuse steel beams? There are examples of where it happens. How do we, you know, make that much more widespread? 
Thank you. Um, moving to Martin, um, I'll, I'll try not to ask two questions because it's always difficult, isn't it, to try and remember ask, <laughs> multiple ask, points. Ask so, as many as you want, Peter. No, it's fine. It's, I, I, I hate it because I can never remember what I've been asked. Um, it's regarding EVs. Um, if we force the rollout uh, without changing designs and materials used in the vehicles themselves, um, we're likely to introduce a lot of embodied carbon. What approaches do you see emerging amongst vehicle manufacturers to counter that? Yeah, great. Uh, just to explain to people watching, by the way, I've not been busy getting on with some side work. I, I have been trying to answer some of the questions in the uh, in the chat while others were talking, whilst keeping an ear out. Um, hopefully that wasn't too rude. I'm trying to provide as much information as possible. Um, so this is one I just I did just jot, jot down a few points. I mean, this is uh, again to Peter's comment. There's no point in taking a load of tailpipe emissions out of our cities if we're going to redistribute it elsewhere. And uh, you can see some uh, fairly good empirical evidence that are, that, that are bev based on today's value chains actually is worse for the environment than a than a modern uh, petrol or diesel engine. So our aspirations a bit a bit beyond that. So we have to look at the embedded carbon. Uh, I've talked briefly about the utilisation of green energy uh, when we're processing the, the various materials. So, for example, um, processing graphite, the graphitisation process draws a lot of electricity. If we're just going to burn coal, as in some, uh, let's say, EU member states, when they do this process, uh, you know, where's the sense in that? In that way, madness lies. So, I think. You know, you have to look at the overall embedded carbon. Um, we're likely to, sh we, we see already an advised shift from tailpipe, tailpipe to the whole value chain from a carbon perspective, from an EU perspective. Um, so at some point that's likely to be uh, more enforced than just advised. Uh, and that, that's going to drive behaviours. We've, we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months uh, that suddenly companies are waking up to this fact and, uh, you know, set, setting up a, a plant in an economy with 85% coal driven electricity generation it is no longer seen as a strategic smart move. Thank you, Martin. It's very uh, thought provoking as well. Uh, um, Graham, um, I have a question for you um, about ITM's place in the Sheffield and Sheffield City region uh, economy. So you, you're clearly achieving great things, uh, showing the world what we can do as a city um, with new technology. Uh, and the Sheffield location is emphasised in presentations. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about the strategy of engaging with other Sheffield businesses in the supply chain and maybe also with the, you know what we've been doing at the LEP? Um, and the sort of how it fits back into the strategic economic plan, which I talked about at the outset about uh, sustainable, uh, environmentally uh, good growth for the economy. Yeah, okay, so very, um, very keen to engage with the region. Uh, in fact, um, I, I um, am in discussion with Dan Jarvis's office about. Um, having a green hydrogen meeting where we bring together the local supply chain and uh, we, we're very keen on doing that. Um, there's a, another company in Sheffield called Pressure Technologies. It used to be called Chesterfield Cylinders and we work closely with them um, and we use a number of suppliers um, in the city. We use as many suppliers as we, could, we can actually locally and, and that is quite an important strategy for us. And, uh, you know, even when we fitted out our new offices, we used the, the local office firm to do that. Um, and, and, and we do emphasize uh, that as much as we can. I suppose the, the most important thing about the local economy is the creation of jobs uh, and training and apprenticeships. And we just established a thing called ITM Academy. And the ITM Academy is about training engineers it's about um, uh, having our own hydrogen apprenticeship scheme and it's also about um, outreach, technical outreach. 
So um, uh, we hope to have a very significant effect in the local It's important to us. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, a um, couple of questions about, um, one is uh, replacement diesel fuels and av availability, um, which is one topic. And then just uh, thinking about Sheffield, um, it's probably equally true for other cities in the UK. Your opinions on waste to energy district heating and uh, and the role in future? Yeah, thanks. So uh, replacement diesel is an interesting one because um, the the analogy is, you know, if, if you take the human body and you feed it full of junk food, it won't work very well and it will cause you a lot in the future. It's the same with the climate. If you've got a diesel, the diesel engine is not the problem. It's the diesel fuel that's the problem. If you can replace it with what's known as e-fuels in, in the European Union or power to X, then you have the potential of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, converting it into uh, a diesel replacement. It is not diesel. It's completely different. It's called dimethyl ether. It's much better. It means the engine will perform better. Uh, and it, it means that you can keep the existing cars, which have you know been designed over many years, still operating, but at a much reduced uh, CO2 output. Um, so I think Sheffield has a great opportunity for this. We, we've got a project going at the moment uh, with Tata Steel and Liberty Steel and Forge Masters, where we're going to take the steel gases and convert it into dimethyl ether, which will go into the ground fleet. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to talk to Graham at ITM Power because we need hydrogen. Um, and, you know, w without the hydrogen, that, that supply chain doesn't work. Uh, and the, the second question was about what, sorry, what, what can we do to... Sorry, um, what is um, your opinion on um, waste to energy oh, district heating networks and the role of, in future of, of that? Yeah, so that, that's interesting because the reason I got into carbon dioxide utilization was that originally I was working on landfill, landfill mining to get the resources back into the supply chain. But then DEFRA changed the goalposts and said district heating uh, energy from waste was the way forward. It is. It involves capturing the emissions, though, and you need to do something with the emissions. So, again, capture the emissions, make them into dimethyl ether, make them into diesel, power the fleet of vehicles. But also, I, I would flag up a company that are not from the region, but uh, Carbonate, which originated from Greenwich. Uh, they take carbon dioxide and waste uh, air pollution control residues, uh, so bottom ash, top ash, from incinerators, and convert it into building blocks. So these building blocks go into construction, and they're carbon negative building blocks. So again, that it, it's it's a web of interconnectivity. What we can do in the energy sector and making new fuels, we can also translate into the um, in, into the construction sector and make more carbon neutral or carbon negative materials. So it's thinking of the whole system, not just isolated policies. Thank you. Um, looking at the clock, um, we've got time for one more question. I'm going to put this question to all four of you in turn, if that's OK, because I think it's one that is generally relevant, uh, given your expertise. And it's really what one piece of legislation or regulation would you each like to see that will make a significant difference to this journey? What is most frustrating to you that you think, well, if we could have that, that would make the difference as far as I'm concerned. So we'll just go around. Um, start with Danielle and, and go just picking the one is tricky. Um, yeah, but I I would, I'd start with removing uh, VAT on energy efficiency measures um, so that it's cheaper to retrofit our homes, but also to have a scheme, something like either paying back stamp duty on a home if you retrofit it shortly after buying it, so within a year of buying it or um, requiring certain levels of energy, energy efficiency of your home to actually be able to sell it, because we've got to get that intervention point of how do we get more people to retrofit? Um, and if it's either carrot or stick, and we're asked particularly about stick here, so. 
those are my views. Well, my, my day job uh, is a chartered tax advisor. And one of my frustrations is just that, the fact that we have um, initiative after initiative on the tax code, which then peters out. And then we have another initiative. We never, we don't have this consistent approach to a particular area. And you, we've seen in this year's budget that we've suddenly been given these hugely enhanced tax allowances for plant and machinery investment. Uh, but they'll be gone again in a year or two. So it is very, it is very frustrating. Yeah, I agree. That's a really important area. Um, so, um, Martin, um, no one from government's listening. So, Excellent. Yeah, I mean, just to just to demonstrate that my training is going very nicely. I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, obliquely kind of uh, answer this question uh, slash uh, duck it. Uh, I mean, for years, um, I've been arguing the case that we have a clear strategy and that we have investment support for companies to de-risk those investments. And frankly, I've got that. Um, so, you know, I will just point to some existing legislation, some existing support that's available for companies that would like to invest. Uh, apologies, Peter, but that's all you can get from me on that one. Uh, Graham? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to create a global feedback loop. What I'd like is a global enforced carbon tax, and I'd like all of the money that generate, is generated from the global carbon tax to be reinvested in renewable technology. Thank you. And Peter. So my, my thunder has been stolen to some extent because uh, I've got, I've got to, again, there isn't one policy. I think it's a two policies that really stand out. They can be brought together under fiscal interventions. One is a carbon tax, which is reasonable and representative and I work with uh, Glenn Murray in Ontario where they introduced a carbon tax the money that was generating the carbon tax went to R&D into green technologies and, and that worked well until there was a power shift uh, and the other one is VAT as, as Danielle said so if you read the bankers for net zero retrofitting to net zero uh, we propose um, zero VAT on uh, low at low carbon construction materials um, and I would extend that to all low carbon products. Uh, the, the real problem is that you pay 5% VAT to buy gas but you pay 20% VAT to buy the insulation to uh, ward against the problems of the gas. So yeah VAT and carbon tax fiscal interventions coupled with financial interventions. Thank you very much. Well, that takes us uh, to the, the end of the Q&A. Uh, thank you to the panel for your answers on that. I'll just uh, spend a couple of minutes just to wrap up the session um, and then hand back uh, to Peter uh, who, will, who will close the meeting. Um, I just want to say that to my let role is to try and bring a business voice to uh, the politics in Sheffield City region. And a key part of that role is to listen to experts such as we've listen to this evening to learn and to try and uh, bring even a small percentage of that expertise uh, into our work. Um, I'm here because the LEP is outward facing and needs every one of you um, taking part uh, in this session today uh, to be part of the journey. So we've got knowledge shared, common sense, uh, practical ex expertise um, because this drive um, which has got to be delivered by uh, our local uh, leaders is an enormous challenge and um, we've work to do uh, but work in a balanced way. Uh, I would encourage you to get in touch with me um, offline by email or by um, through my LinkedIn page or through any other method that you find most convenient um, and the details of our panel are also up on screen at the moment. If you feel strongly and you've got a point, then please send me a message. Um, I'll I'll try and feed it back into the mayoral combined authority. Um, thanks very very much to all the panel for giving up their time uh, and for their presentations and for expertly fielding uh, the questions. It is appreciated. Uh, thanks to the Webex audience. Um, 
of over 100 people. Uh, it's great to see so many people taking time um, early evening to take part. And thanks for your questions, participation and interest. Uh, thanks to all the engineering institutes for coming together to put on this uh, event, uh, particularly uh, Penny Marshall and Peter Henry, uh, who asked me to chair the session, and to Joanne behind the scenes with the ball on the slides, making sure that everything works smoothly. And with that, thank you. I'll hand back to Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to echo everything that, uh, that Peter's just said there. I mean, thank you so much to Peter for chairing it. Thank you so much to all our panelists for, um, for taking the time to do that tonight. It's been a really, really great evening. Um, I know it's such a big topic to cover. I know that 10 minutes uh, wasn't very much for all of your slides um, in such a short space of time, but you know, thank you for that again. It's been, uh, it's been really good.